is risen. He is risen Welcome to Mission Del Sol. We are so glad you have joined us for worship today. If you're worshiping with us online, we encourage you to let us know you're here by signing in on Facebook or on the virtual friendship pad so that we might greet each other following the service. During our time together in worship, we'll have a time for our young and young at heart to come forward for the children's message. We'll come right here in front of the pulpit um, to sit down and have a little conversation about our scripture, and then kids will be returning to their seats um, for the service. I think that's what we need to know about our service today, so let us be called to worship. Please rise in heart and mind and join me in our responsive call to worship. Christ has risen. He has risen you have turned our mourning into dancing. You have reclothed us in joy. Let us shout our praise. Christ has risen. Alleluia. Amen. Please be seated. Early in the morning,
morning, the truth was shared with fearful friends. Not even death can keep us from Christ. Our God who lived, died, and rose for you stands beside you today. Let us confess our fears and our amazement together and then in silence. Jesus, on this morning of Alleluia's, we claim your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness, but we have responded like the crowd. We have judged ourselves and others unfairly. We have taken what we wanted instead of sharing what we have. We have not intentionally hurt anyone, but our actions have affected others. Forgive us for not healing the broken, supporting the weak, and showing kindness to all. Make us more like you. Transform us with your resurrection grace. Now hear our silent prayers of confession. Amen. This is the good news. The stone is rolled away. The tomb is empty. Sin is powerless. Death is defeated forever. We are called to this new life, a life of forgiveness and reconciliation. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us rise to sing our praise. words from Jesus to the disciples after his resurrection were, peace be with you. The disciples were afraid and surprised by Jesus' presence and his words. But the first gift Jesus offered his friends was peace. And so we too share peace with one another. Let us share that peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Grace and peace be with all of you today, and happy Easter. Today, during our worship service, I, after our worship service, I invite you to come over across the way into Mission Hall. We'll have a brunch over there, 
um, hosted by our Congregational Life folks. We also have a photo booth for you to take your Easter photos and all of your best dressed outfits. You guys all look so great today. Um, a few other things going on in the life and ministry of the church. Next, on um, this coming Saturday, is our blessing of the animal service at 9 a.m. Uh, so I invite you to bring your pets uh, to the service outside, and we will gather for a celebration of worship and also an individual blessing for each of your beloved pets. So I can't wait to see that. We also have our worship in the park coming on April 21st, so you are all enjoyed, invited to join us for worship outside. Hopefully it won't be raining like today, um, but it will be a great day to be together. This coming Friday, we also have our happy hour. So join us for some time of fellowship and conversation. We'll be meeting at the Kinsey's home. Um, so come and hang out. It'll be fun. Uh, I think that's uh, all the announcements we have going on in the life and ministry of the church that you need to know. But I encourage you to see the soundings or the Wednesday, the Wednesday soundings or the Saturday email for more about how you can get involved in the life and ministry here. But now I'd like to invite our young and young at heart to come forward for our children's message. Hey guys, I have some games to play. Do you guys like to play games? Yes. Okay. So I need um, some teams of people. Scoot on over you. So, so I need a couple of teams. Can we uh, divide into t three teams? Because that seems good, right? How many, t how many people are in the team? Okay. Okay, so teams of three, that's pretty good. Okay, so, do you, do you guys wanna be together? Okay, so Piper, can you come with them? Paxson, will you go with the two, with the Parnells? Come, you guys are gonna wanna come down here because we're gonna all join together and you have an assignment. The three of you guys together. Mia, you can help with these three kids, okay? So what you're gonna do is you're all gonna need to see how many in 30 seconds, how many of these eggs you can stack on top of each other? Yep. Here you go. You're gonna need to come down here. Come on. So. Ready? Not yet, not yet. Oh, my phone is in my other pocket. Shoot. <laughs> Too many pockets. Okay, you ready? Set. Go. Go, 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 go. How many can you? Faster, 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 faster. Stop. You have to have them stacked on the ground, Henry. <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay, you can put those on there. How many you got, Piper? You seem to have a lot. Who has the most? <clears throat> That's pretty good. Okay, Henry, how many do you have? Good job, but you know what? You guys all did really great. Way to go, Paxson. You did awesome. How many did you have? Six. That's the best. Mia, did you get three? Way to go. You guys are the you guys did so good. I'm so proud of you. Way to go. Good job. Good job. Way to lose. 
<laughs> you guys really rocked it. I'm so proud of you. Okay, I have one more game for you. Can you all put those back in here? This one's a little bit harder. Okay, this one, I need a volunteer, two volunteers. Come on over here. Come on, Piper. So, you're going to put this basket on your head. <laughs> you can just hold it behind your head like this. Because Piper has to throw these eggs into the basket <laughs> on top of your head. Turn around, because no one wants to be thrown in your face. Yep, let's see. Oh, where'd it go? Keep going, let's see it. Two, three, four, oh no, four, five, oh. Okay, that's pretty good, let's do one more. Okay, who wants to try it? Good job, anybody? Come on guys, you wanna be, a, you wanna have it on your head? Who's gonna, who's gonna throw eggs? Come on, Margaret. Turn around. Let's see. She got four in there. Okay. Let's see if anybody else wants to try one more. <coughs> Keep going. You gotta try. Oh, yes. Getting closer. <laughs> Way to lose. You did a good job. Anybody else want to try? Anybody? Piper, you already did the best. You got four in. Thank you very much. She noticed that um, you want to do it? You want to throw it or you want it on your head? Okay, who's going to put it on your head? Okay, Piper, come on. <laughs> Let's see if you got it, Paxton. Not quite. A little farther. Oh, close. Close. She's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, one more. Yeah. You know, did you guys notice how everybody cheered when, when he got one? We all cheer every time we, get, we do a good job or we get successful. Well, in our text today, it talks about how when we lose, that's when we got cheers. She's fine. Um, it doesn't really matter what we do, actually. God says whether you win or lose, God loves us no matter what. And God thinks that everybody is super special. So we remember on Easter that it doesn't matter whether you won a game, whether you got all four in there like Piper did. I mean, she rocked the candy toss. Or if you stack the most like Henry did, we all are winners in God's book. And God loves us no matter what. Can we pray together? Dear God, thank you for loving us, no matter what, whether we are winners or losers. Amen. Okay, stay right there because I have a special sticker book for our, uh, everybody to do during Easter in the service. Do you want to take some eggs to your seat, Mia? Maybe? Pretty great. Okay, you guys can go back to your seats.
Today's scripture reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 39. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord, we gather in your hope this morning to hear your word for us today. Please open our hearts and our minds that we might hear and know about your hope on this resurrected day. Amen. So it's all about hope, if you couldn't tell from the letters on front. Hope is what gets us going in the morning. It's the sun that's peeking over the mountains, at least when it's not raining. It's the experience of newfound love. It's about the birth of a baby. It's laughter. It's hugs. It's, well, you know, you all told us. So let's turn our attention to the screens to watch this video about what hope looks like. Uh, talking to kids from ages 3 to 18, I just love hearing the hope and their perspective on the world. I'm hopeful that the congregation I serve will have all the blessings of this season of Easter. Our grandkids. You want to know gives me hope? Even Dave's thinking about Jesus. His back has a cross on it. My children, I love seeing their smiling faces. So spending some time here at this food bank, Gives me hope that there are many, many people who care about other people and that they give their time. And that makes me feel, feel good. Rainbows give me hope. I love the sun. Coffee gives me hope. The spring, the new birth, a new life. Good friends and laughter. Playing with soapy Play Doh and knowing I'll get clean in my bathtub later. Hey, <laughs> my pasture. Healthy people who love the Lord. I'm hopeful that we continue to grow as a church and as a congregation. Some nice country music. <laughs> Family vacation, being with my whole family in one spot. Knowing that God is always with me. I'm hopeful that everybody that was at St. Mary's today tells at least one person in the congregation what a great time they had. I am hoping fewer pigeons. Definitely the resurrection of Jesus. It's in the youth, in the kids that come to our church every day that I wake up in the morning and see the sun shining. Children. Because they look at things and look at life as this adventure. But most importantly, my past. The things that I've gotten through, that God has walked me through. 
gives me hope that whatever comes in the future, God will walk with me there too. Amen. But you know, that's just a little bit of the places we find hope in our day. We all need a little bit more hope, right? That feeling that everything is really going to be okay, even when we're not sure. That we have a way through this complicated life. When we show up with, with what happens when we don't What happens when we don't feel so hopeful on Easter? When we don't show up when everyone else is ready to celebrate after three days of Jesus in the tomb? In our lives, they just feel like a lot. Maybe they feel like too much. Maybe they just feel like we don't, aren't sure about Jesus and the resurrection. That's what the experience was for the women that morning, for the disciples, and for all the followers of Jesus on that first Easter. All the gospel writers have a little bit different story about how it happened that morning, but one thing that was sure was that Jesus was laid to rest in a tomb and there was a group of women who showed up. They didn't go with shouts of acclamations or any hallelujahs. There was little hope in their hearts because they went there in grief, just like when we go to places to remember and honor the people who lost and who died before us. The difference is what happened when they got there. The rock that had covered the tomb when they left that night, three nights ago, was rolled away. The angel was there and told them that Jesus was among the living and not the dead, which was just a lot more confusing to a group of women who were supposed to be grieving. So they probably went to go tell the disciples what they saw, but they too struggled to believe it. The disciples, they were still in hiding, they were afraid of what the Pharisees might do to them because they were followers of Jesus. They were ashamed for abandoning Jesus, even though they promised to never leave him or forsake him. They felt hopeless because the person they believed would save the world had died three days ago. And he was not coming back, or at least that's what they thought. On top of all of that, they were grieving the loss of someone that they really cared about. Someone that they spent the last three years every day in, day in, and day out with. And the worst? They went from feeling like they were winners, following the Son of God into Jerusalem with shouts of acclamation and praise and hallelujahs last week, to losers whose leader died on the cross. Maybe we too aren't quite ready to shout out hallelujahs Maybe we're with the disciples who are frozen in time about memories in the past and worried about what might that mean for the future and wishing that we still had a little more hope in what God was doing today. <clears throat> the problem with admitting that we don't have much hope is that we don't really want people to think that we've lost. We always want to think we've won. We don't want to be losers next to their winners. Have you ever noticed how easily we blame losers? Like, for example, when your favorite sports team is you're watching the game you, and they win, you say, we won. But if they lose, you say, they lost. Or when you get an A on the paper, you say, Dad, I got an A on my paper. Or the teacher gave me a D. <laughs> we tend to align ourselves with victories every time and put space between ourselves and defeats because we don't want to be associated with things that are wrong. We always, always want to be as far away from that as possible. And there's a lot of things that we feel defeated about. The constant pile of laundry, the always full dishwasher, another meal that keeps, we have to keep planning day in and day out, full schedules and expectations about how we want things to be, and also feeling paralyzed by the amount of things on our to-do list that keep getting put in the queue of upholiness. And maybe you come weighed down by all the challenges of the world, <coughs> the wars around the globe, gun violence that keeps taking lives of those young and old, political debates that hum in the background about racism and sexism and abortion and immigration, and it's just a lot. 
And like the disciples, maybe you showed up today a little bit in the dark, maybe feeling a little lost, maybe not wanting to admit that you feel a little bit like one of those losers. With the death of Jesus looming over us, with hope only on the horizon, with hesitantly spoken words of hope, we wait, we show up here. And we hear that angel say, Jesus is alive. And we see an empty tomb. And Jesus calls to Mary in the garden, and she knows who he is by the sound of her voice. And Jesus says, peace be with you to the disciples in the upper room. Or when Jesus breaks bread with the disciples traveling to Emmaus, and they know that it is Jesus. They start to bring these glimmers of hope in the darkness of struggle and hardship, which is why Paul's text today is such good news on this Easter morning. We've spent the last season of Lent reading through Romans, these first eight chapters. And up to this point, Paul has spent the time reframing hope. From hope that we put in worldly things, the hope found in Jesus who takes our broken and messy world and turns it into something beautiful. But now, Paul is getting into the everything of life. He realizes that hope is not just something that is big and bold, but hope happens all the time, in the hard, in the struggle. He realizes that our social media profiles don't tell the whole story about hope, that our answers that we're fine all the time are just covers for the messy moments that we feel out of control, and a little hopeless, like we're on a hamster wheel just running in the same place, never getting ahead. And we hope that no one finds out that we feel a little bit like a loser, because we feel like everybody else seems to have it together when we don't. In our text today, Paul names all of it. Everything in our life that touches us from the highs and the lows, from the joys and the sorrows, from those fleeting moments when we feel like winners to those other moments when we feel like we're lost and alone and hopeless. And Paul says this is exactly why Jesus came. From the very beginning of time, God had made the decision to shape our lives of those he loves along the same as his own. So Jesus lived and died and rose again on Easter, all for this moment, for love. And that is why we really showed up today, right? To be reminded that you are not a loser or lost or broken or too messy or whatever is happening in your life to be too much. That apparently is the timer I set for the kids. <laughs> 20 minutes, not 20 seconds. <laughs> See, just a little too messy. <laughs> because today, today you find out that you actually are a winner. The Greek in our text says that, act, that you are more than a winner. That you are a hyper winner is the Greek translation, which we often see translated as more than conquerors in this text. And I can tell you one thing. I have never felt like I've conquered anything in my life alone, let alone feeling like I more than conquered it. But wouldn't it feel great to win? To feel like I won over that really smart kid in school? Or that coworker who seems to get it all even though they do hardly anything? And they get all the accolades? And suddenly, wouldn't it be nice if the good people actually won over the bad people? Those who like take what isn't theirs, who judge and cheat the system, who bully others, I want them to lose so the good people can finally win, right? And Paul says that in Christ, we're able to conquer all trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword. That should cover everything, right? Because those were the hardest places of the time. And it would have been like Paul described everything in our everyday life that threatens us or makes us feel unhappy or is difficult. It would have been like we were conquerors of every hard thing we ever imagined. Like if we were really good Christians and faithful enough, we wouldn't have to go through any of those difficulties 
because we finally would be conquerors. But that's not exactly what Paul says, even though sometimes I wish it was. Instead, he says something even better. He says that we would never be victorious over all of these hard things, but in them. See, being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean the hard stuff doesn't happen or that we win and other people lose. But rather, like Jesus, we find victory smack dab in the middle of life's worst and best realities. And it's there where we find love. When Paul says, what can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus? It's as if he said, not war or unemployment or depression or political turmoil or cancer or divorce or miscarriage or guns in school, or racism, or failures, or addictions, or abortions, or mental health, or disabilities, not who you voted for, or who you didn't vote for, or what way you roll the toilet paper. Nothing you do can change the way God loves you. Nothing that you're going through right now can change the way God loves you, he says. And our hope isn't a dream. It's right here in the middle of the hard and overwhelming and stressful things that are happening. It's right here in the midst of all the good and joyful and hallelujahs we announce. Because it's never been about accolades or successes that help us conquer all of this. It's never about good luck or chance. It's always been about love. Now love often gets confusing. Sometimes we think that love looks like winning, or it looks like getting it right, or what, what we get when we're good, or that it's going to be taken away at a moment's notice because of an action we did or didn't do. But love isn't like that, especially not the love of God. You know, sometimes that we overestimate love and say that if we had it, everything would just be better, or we underestimate it and say that love isn't going to pay the bills or get the things done on the to-do list, so we don't really need it. Other times, we over-sentimentalize it, like on Hallmark. But the truth is that there is a lot of power in love. Not just the romantic kind of love, but the love that really cares for each other. The love that can change the world because of our actions and our attitudes. The love that just feels right, like a warm embrace. Love that has reason and a source. And the truth is that we are made to love, and our lives are designed to be lived out in that kind of love. The love whose only source is the risen Jesus Christ himself. And it was in Jesus that he defined ministry as our sole purpose, to love God and love people. That's what he did. And that's what God calls us to do, too. And when we love, we do have the power to conquer the whole world. Because in love for us, Jesus died to go to the places where there is no hope to be found. And he rose to the heights of joy so that hope can live into every moment of our lives. And when Jesus showed up to the disciples that day, when he saw Mary in the garden, when he walked along on the road to Emmaus. Some felt sad, some were afraid, some started heading home, some were grieving. But interestingly enough, none of them felt hope. Even though Jesus told them three times that this was what was gonna happen, that he would die and rise three days later, but still, they failed to hear and remember the hope. The power of the Easter message is that there is not one place or time or event that can separate you from the love of God. Not one thing. That means that there is always, always hope. Hope in the midst of health issues. Hope in a God that's doing something in the midst of war and strife around the world. Hope that during grief or fear or loss, God is with us. Hope that our actions and our attitudes are enough because they really are. Hope that God is alive and working today because he is. Not because of something we heard or something someone said, but because we know it. 
Because of Easter, we have hope that there is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God. Not one thing. Jesus' death and resurrection covers everyone and everything imaginable. And we know, through the deep hope of the cosmos, the victory does come through defeat. The healing does come through humility. That this is the gospel way, and we follow it even though it often leads us away from the successes as the world calls us. Because losers like us do not conform to the world, but realize that we are winners this whole time. We become winners by losing, we gain by dying. We have victory over all things that Jesus came to this world to live, to die, to rise, and to love our broken world so that we can have hope every single day in every moment of whatever is happening in your life. Because hope is alive. Amen.
Let us stand and profess our faith that we just sung, saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> May be seated. Prayers that have come to us to the prayer chain include continued prayers for Chuck Zimmerman and his family, continued prayers for Dylan, Hillary Cummings' son, and continued prayers for Sandra Ortiz. Let us go to God in prayer today. During our time of prayer, I'll have a time open if you are welcome to pray aloud um, for those that you would like to lift up in prayer as well. Let us pray. Jesus, we gather this morning when everything finally makes sense again. We have wondered, doubted, questioned, and asked, but we stand in awe of the fullness of who you are. In absence we see, in silence we hear, in the darkness everything is finally clear. You are right. You have had it all under control this whole time, and our greatest prayer the answer that we have been looking for is to see you and your grace and truth in our lives. We realize that the tomb is empty because of our need of your grace when we fail to be obedient to you. It's empty because we need your healing mercies, the comfort of your embrace and your sustaining hope day in and day out no matter what has happened. 
which is why we know we can lift up our prayers to you, those spoken aloud and said in silence. Lord, in your mercy. 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 Lord, you are in the everything of our lives, which is why we know that you are with Chuck and Dylan and Sandra and their families. We know that we can see your love in the everything of life, in the heights that are sung and spoken alleluias, in the beautiful sunrise, in new life, in the beautiful blooming of the desert. Thank you for friends and family and our brunch this morning. We also know that we find your love in the depths of the cross and the fears of our future and the griefs that we hold too deep to say aloud in disease and war and hate and worry and loss. And those moments when we just feel like we can't get it together. Thank you for reminding us to love you and that your love is in every time we join together in every encounter we have, in every ordinary and extraordinary <clears throat> moment, every moment that we stand in awe of you. And Jesus, in the midst of all of it that you've done for us, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for saving us, for standing next to us, for leading us, for loving us, for letting our lives be proof of good news. Help us be witnesses to those around us by proclaiming your peace that is within us and within them too. Let your words and actions live in the, in the service, in our lives and service bear witness to your resurrection power. For in the name of the living Lord Jesus Christ, we lift our prayers to you, the one we know as father and mother, a savior of the world and hope. So we join together, praying the prayer you taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection have led to this moment. Let us give all that we have back to God. Join me in giving through our online giving webpage found in the link or QR code.
Jesus, you are alive. Thanks be to God. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for rising again. And thank you for using these gifts for your glory and purposes for your people here and far away. Amen. Just remember, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Neither heights, nor depths, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor anything in all of creation that can separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. And that, friends, is our hope. Which is why, when you walked in, you got just a little bit of hope and a little card to take with you to remind you that we all have hope to live into no matter where we are or what we go, do or what is happening in your life right now there's always something to have hope in in our lord and savior may the grace of our lord jesus christ go with you may the love of god the father surround you and the communion of the holy spirit be with you now and always amen